listen, capitalism is the only thing that works and we just have to make it a little bit more, you know, women's rights, gay rights, healthcare and so on and so on. But that's for me left, left Fukuyamaism. You accept the system. I think that this confused protest coming today it make it clear that no, liberal capitalism is not the ultimate forum. It will not work. And precisely that's why I spoke about all those problems uh, just three today. Uh, uh, migrants, ecology, digital control. None of them could be solved in liberal capitalist frame. There's no more prescient work in critique of capitalism than the tiny manifesto, the world-renowned and vilified work, the Communist Manifesto. But it has been hundreds of years since the manifesto's creation. With a manifesto that is anchored directly into materialism, how accurate and relevant can it be when the very nature and conditions of material has changed? Zizek argues it is now arguably in its most relevant state, a relevancy seen precisely because of the conceptual evolution of materialism itself. Yet, to Zizek, we cannot avoid the fact that this relevancy is still radically different from the time of Marx and Engels. The same language and concepts just don't quite map the socio-economic and political world today. The true relevancy of the Communist Manifesto is one of dialectics and movement a movement that changes its context, and a movement that Zizek claims is the actual Marxist analysis needed. One that is not radically tied to an ideological narrative stagnantly and forcefully caught in historical limbo, something that we often see with Marxism today. This is hands down one of my favorite works of Zizek. This is where Zizek precisely shines, when he can add further clarity to Marx in a dialectical form. For that, let's get into it. This is the relevancy of the Communist Manifesto, just in video form. Zizek starts this out with, The end is near, only not the way we imagined it. Capitalism today stands in its most progressive and quote-unquote free state today which to Zizek ironically puts capitalism at its most dangerous and pervasive. For this new capitalist progressive aesthetic, new analysis naturally comes. Some of the most prescient ideas of Marxism fall within a continuum of constant revolution and an inevitable end of capitalism, an end likely many Marxist thinkers of the past would have imagined by now. Yet Zizek remains clear in the Marxist prediction that the end of capitalism will happen, and more specifically, is currently happening as we speak, just not within the proletariat and working class as a whole. We are already almost approaching there a kind of a weird communism. I don't know how it is here with you, but in my part of Europe, DVDs are disappearing, you download everything. It's already... It's, I, I think, okay, this is one phenomenon, but I think that generally there is something in so-called intellectual property, knowledge and so on, which is communist in its very nature, in the sense that it resists being constrained by private property. It tends to circulate freely. So again, how to solve this problem? I don't think that capitalism will succeed in privatizing intellectual property. It's a private, open source, technocratic revolution. But before we get into exactly what this means, we have to lay some groundwork and answer an important question. Why isn't this being spearheaded by the working class then? In many functions, it sort of is, but in the larger picture, not really. Zizek points out to Gerald A. Cohen's movement and formation of the working class. Here's a rough formation. Number one, it constitutes the majority in a society. Two, it produces the wealth of the society. Number three, it consists of the exploited members of a society. Number four, its members are the needy people in society. When these four features are combined, they typically generate two further features. Number five, the working class has nothing to lose from revolution. And number six, the working class can and will engage in a revolutionary transformation of society. Zizek directly claims none of the first four features all fit together synchronously in today's world, which may be why features five and six haven't completely came to fruition and generated the expected outcome. Marx relies heavily on the idea of a unified proletariat as a gateway to revolution, a unification that depends much on its own recognition. 
Yet in this world, the recognition of a working class is at its absolutely most complex point. A barista in San Francisco, a Kansas City and computer engineer, and a New York carpenter's exploitation often take on radically different forms. And further, to elaborate on Cohen's point number four around a needy group, the form of the bourgeoisie nicely fits in this category today. They appear as the ultimate needy ones. They have to be bailed out every 10 years, they receive the majority of welfare, and their central aesthetic and ideology now blends in. Where the new bourgeoisie fit in as Mark Fisher coined the new quote-unquote liberal communism. With people like Mark Zuckerberg, Elon Musk, and Bill Gates embodying this new liberal communism phenomenon. This is all packed on top of a neoliberal, radically individual world where being exploited more, working longer hours, is to appear as not needy and self-sufficient. Thus the worker receives a false appearance of autonomy and self-sufficiency in his very exploitation. So with that said, what is Zizek's point on a new revolution? As stated earlier, the revolution is a private and capitalistic one, yet entrenched in new forms of open source and creative common technologies that can only survive by eliminating access to technological barriers. Essentially, technology and information, if it will be successful, must be completely given away and accessed by all in the future. Market exchange and private intellectual property could hinder this technological front. We see this with the new Internet of Things, future smart cities, homes, cars, etc. Ultimately, technology that needs to communicate with each other in order to operate properly. Thus, in order for this technology to succeed and change the world, there can't be fundamental barriers brought up by market exchange. It can't cost too much money, and in many ways, it has to be free. I won't get into detail about the Internet of Things or smart production technology, but if you are interested, it would be worth looking up. Essentially, this will only succeed through common access for all, and we are just scratching the surface with this technological phenomenon. But Zizek claims there's irony in this. The US, if anything, is ahead of all other ex-communist states in this very technology. Zizek points out this really weird new technocratic bourgeoisie in the United States through the lens of this contradiction. The crudest Marxist hypothesis seems to be revindicated. The development of new productive forces makes capitalist relations obsolete. The ultimate irony is that while former communists, China, Vietnam, are today the best managers of capitalism, developed capitalist countries go furthest in the direction of collaborative or cooperative commons as the way to overcome capitalism. In a very Marxist way, the collapse of capitalism will happen within itself, yet in a radically different context. But of course, this technological emancipation will lead to new dangers new dangers that actually feed capitalism in the end. This allows the state and private sector to gain control over cooperation, and we are seeing it today under the new emergent technocratic economy of rent. Contacting people is privatized through Facebook, software is privatized under Microsoft, and browsing the internet is privatized through Google. Rent, how we see it, is usually through the renting of land and real estate. Now under technology and software, it's owning platforms and completely sucking up market share. For example, Netflix purchases as much movies, general content, TV shows as possible, primarily as to become the most dominant entertainment suite, and you pay rent in order to access it. The goal is to dominate the access and promote your platform as a monopoly. Zizek points out under this phenomenon, the classic Marxist analysis of exploitation evolves. Bill Gates didn't become a billionaire by selling his product at an optimum competitive price, excruciatingly siphoning out worker productivity for minimum pay. Zizek points out that if he did this, Microsoft would have gone under a long time ago. Rather than competing, they established a monolith in Windows, while paying their engineers far more money than anyone would have anticipated. Under the typical Marxist economic analysis, Linux should have won the consumer operating system economic war. This doesn't underscore and lessen the plane of exploitation, it just radically changes its form. In post-capitalist neoliberalism, the philosophical push is for extreme deregulation, yet ironically we necessitate the state even more to secure the contracts, licensing agreements for corporations when they rent out their intellectual property for us all to mindlessly consume. For this, we see Marx's dialectical materialism in full swing. Rather than the inaccurate painting of Marx being a purely moralistic, prescriptive political thinker, so much of his thought was descriptive logic of the ebb and flow of material formations. And here we reach the relevancy all over again. But in a world that is controlled by monolithic corporations with extreme control, the new economic bounds are more globalized than ever. 
Much of the relevancy of the Communist Manifesto exists in dialectical ideas and formations, formations that foresee the global push of unity in the name of capital. Much of the relevancy today may primarily be based in ideas, but globalization is the new materialist formation that has become even more prescient through the years. Yet the small shimmers of idealism that Marx and Engels cannot escape still continue to show up. Here Zizek brings in his inner Mark Fisher and claims that we need to understand the ghosts that still haunt our world. We have gone a bit into Mark Fisher and his ideas of lost futures, here is a link above. In the 19th and 20th century, revolution and communism may have haunted Europe as a future that was within its reach. But today, with the quote-unquote end of history with capitalism, globalization and postmodern cynicism is our ghost. Marx and Engels foresaw a world under capitalism where things become more idyllically equal in theory, and in many ways, in practice. Zizek cites this logic with this, a sentence from the manifesto. The bourgeoisie, wherever it has got the upper hand, has put an end to all feudal patriarchal idyllic relations. Zizek explicitly points out that capitalism precisely flattens out the domain of patriarchy of cultural hierarchical tradition. Yet ironically today, we view anti-sexism, anti-homophobia as the actual minority position. This isn't so. At this point, capitalism has completely incorporated anti-racism, anti-homophobia as the majority hegemonic position. Marx recognized capitalism's ability to transform itself and take on its opposite and ironically make the minority ideology appear as the majority, if permitted. Today, identity politics has virtually replaced any fundamental class analysis in academia, with the idea that this precisely has happened because the ideological front capitalism has used to morph itself. This goes even further, and this is where we get into the Hegelian core of Zizek here. At this point, we reach the supreme irony of how ideology functions today. It appears precisely as its own opposite, as a radical critique of ideological utopias. The predominant ideology today is not of a positive vision of some utopian future, but a cynical resignation, an acceptance of how the world really is, accompanied by a warning that if we want to change it too much, only totalitarian horror can ensue. Every vision of another world is dismissed as ideology, Elaine Badiou put it in a wonderful and precise way. The main function of ideological censorship today is not to crush actual resistance, this is the job of repressive state apparatuses, but to crush hope, to denounce immediately every critical project as opening a path at the end of which lies something like a gulag. This very dialectic and analysis of opposites moves us further, that of fictitious capital and commodity fetishism. What is fictitious capital and commodity fetishism but ghosts that further solidify the idea that capital, also being a ghost, is just dead, just a mindless zombie doing its part in day-to-day -day lives and transactions? The reason why I'm still a Marxist is that I claim that this structure of belief, of displaced belief, you find it in what Marx described as commodity fetishism. Here is the very beginning of the famous subdivision four of the chapter of chapter one of Capital on fetishism of the commodity and its secret. I quote, a commodity appears at first sight an extremely obvious trivial thing, but its analysis brings out that it is a very strange thing, abounding in metaphysical subtleties and theological niceties, end of quote. <clears throat> now, I hope if you listen even vaguely to these lines, I hope you were a little bit surprised by them. And I think this brings us to the very core of what is still, to use these pompous words, alive in Marx, in Marxist theory. Namely, they do not do what we would expect of a, uh, of a critical atheist, materialist thinker. Marx's thesis is not, let's take a religious myth, illusion, and let's demystify it. Let's demonstrate how this spiritual formation was generated by actual life, real life struggles, and so on. Marx says the exact opposite almost. He says here, no, not a thing may appear to you sublime, divine, but it really is just a process of real life struggles, so, uh, social, uh, uh, social alienation, whatever. He says the, exactly the opposite. To get to this idea, we first have to see the inescapable nature of Hegel and Marx. Marx states in the beginning of Capital, a commodity appears at first sight an extremely obvious trivial thing, 
but its analysis brings out that it is a very strange thing abounding in metaphysical subtleties and theological niceties. Understanding commodities, its omniscient power over us as consumers, what then is this than something that foreshadows a conceptual social reality of fictitious capital, something that exists in a plane in which we can't touch, we can't feel? Is this not a foreshadow to capital that is only made in pure financial speculation? That's our capitalism today. It's ultimately fake. Most profits made today are purely speculation, on the promise of a return or interest. When Marx talked about this form of parasitic investment, it relied on the pure exploitation of industrial labor. Today, it's messier than that. This is where Baudrillard coined the term end of production. Back in the day of industrial capitalism, it had a material referent through industrial labor. Today, not so much. In Marx's terminology, we are experiencing parasitic abstract capital in its most pervasive form. Not where it relies solely on direct domination of industrial labor. As brutal as the 19th century was, it had a face. It had a material tactility to it we could reference, and maybe, more easily, rebel. Domination and exploitation takes a different hidden tone today, one through debt and ironically forceful free choice. Since in our society free choice is elevated into a supreme value, social control and domination cannot be allowed to appear as infringing on the subject's freedom. They have to appear as, and be sustained by, the individual's very experience of themselves as free. There is a multitude of forms in which this unfreedom appears in the guise of its opposite. When we are deprived of universal health care, we are told that we are given a new freedom of choice, namely to choose our health care provider. When we can no longer rely on long-term employment and we are compelled to search for a new precarious position every couple of years, we are told that we are given the opportunity to reinvent ourselves and discover new, unexpected, creative potentials that lurk in our personality. When we have to pay for the education of our children, we are told that we become entrepreneurs of the self, acting like a capitalist who has to choose freely on how to invest the resources he or she possesses or borrows into education, health, travel, constantly bombarded by imposed free choices, forced to make decisions that we are, for the most part, not even properly qualified for, or do not possess enough information about, we increasingly experience our freedom as what it effectively is, a burden that deprives us of the true choice of change. Bourgeois society generally obliterates castes and other hierarchies, equalizing all individuals as market subjects divided only by class difference. But today's late capitalism, with its spontaneous ideology, endeavors to obliterate the class division itself by way of proclaiming us all self-entrepreneurs, the differences among us being merely quantitative. A big capitalist borrows hundreds of millions for his or her investment. A poor worker borrows a couple of thousands for his or her supplementary education. This is quite different from the capitalism and state of things Marx knew. But isn't this precisely the point? A very small few orthodox Marxists undeniably like to lock Marx in a deep box and keep his analysis suspended in time, as a religious singularity, an undialectical stagnated monolith. But applying dialectical materialism today, we see that the new mode of material domination is not nearly as material or tactile through direct industrial labor. It's slavery through debt. It's slavery through an existential threat of unlimited choice that ironically does the opposite traps you in a limited financial box. This moves us through the issue of valorization today. Valorization is the process in which surplus value, profits, are created. Ultimately, the process in which labor creates value. In a strictly analytical Marxian sense, this isn't a massive problem if you are in a commune or worker-owned co-op or avoiding direct oppressive working relations. But retroactively examining the Communist Manifesto from the year 2020 can do us wonders with seeing this problem. Zizek precisely points out that there is an issue with the valorization process and the labor theory of value that is now showing its face. In a strict sense, there is a Marxian fetishization of value. You could spend hours toiling away on something, but that does not necessarily make it valuable. Zizek claims that this hyper-focus on value and labor ironically reinforces capitalism to its highest degree. Your labor is still being commodified, and in many ways, when it should not. Here are some real-world examples of this. In the late 20th century feminist movement, it was being discussed through a sort of Marxist orientation that women should be paid for their housework. This is an incredibly logical request, to be honest, especially under the labor theory of value. Women and housewives often work extremely hard. They too should be compensated, right? Sure, but the issue isn't compensation, 
but the form in which this argument exists. Look at what is happening. Housework is being commodified. What is this other than a massive reinforcement of capitalist relations? Commodification can be seen as a savior under this context. Tesla cars, corporatization of green energy, etc. Solutions baked within the commodity form. Zizek weighs in on this here. All these proposals are nothing but greenwashing and commodification of a space from which a fierce attack upon the hegemony of the capitalist mode of production and its alienated relation to nature can be mounted, and their desire to be just and eliminate, or at least constrain, exploitation. Such attempts only enforce an even stronger, all-encompassing commodification. Although they try to be just at the level of content, that is, about what counts as value, they fail to problematize the very form of commodification. And Harvey is right to propose instead to treat value as being in dialectical tension with non-value. In other words, to assert and expand spheres not caught in the production of market value, such as household work or free cultural and scientific work in their crucial role. Perhaps the best thing we can do here is critique the form of valorization, critique the commodity form itself, rather than trying to argue what should fit within it. Working past the cold instinct of commodifying sublime forms of cooperation like housework, scientific research, medical care is the horizon we should take. Further, reducing an analysis of capitalism to raw materialism doesn't work as the function of capital is being abstracted. Profits are now mainly done with speculation and interest. Money itself is becoming digitalized. Here we find a new meaning of the Marxist saying, all that is solid melts into air. Just like what we talked about earlier, mirroring the ideas of limited, limitless choice, a choice that ironically traps you in. We approach a world that is unfree in the guise of freedom. There is many levels in which this quote, unfreedom and freedom exist. First, in a concrete sense, we can point to women's liberation, especially in third world countries. There are liberating forms of capitalism that simultaneously negates this newfound freedom. Women are liberated from traditional life and authoritarian family ties yet are now forced to sell their labor power to survive. In America and Europe, this is becoming more prevalent as women are now viewed as the most desirable employees as the idea being they may be easier to boss around and exploit in a post fordist context. They adapt quicker, they are more flexible workers. In third world countries and a fordist context, women are now directly subjected to industrial labor and sweatshops. This is the material formation of this problem. This dialectic moves towards a more universal logic, though, that encompasses the world in a very Hegelian sense. The Communist Manifesto is one of the first embodiments of true dialectical logic in a manifesto itself, away from what Engels would call Lockean metaphysics, where things are simply things, transfixed in time. But dialectical logic is a process that encompasses opposites. The Lockean metaphysics is what we think of logic today, little unidimensional objects that can be compared and contrasted. Marx uses Hegel to show the very contradictions in which capitalism exists. Thus, dialectics are completely necessary here. Capitalism isn't a mere stagnant thing that we can compare to other economic systems like we think today. It's a shape-shifting, ever-changing process that encompasses contradictions. For that, we see academia, modern comparisons of ideas in our world, is still beyond primitive. To put it in paradoxical term, was for a return of from Marx back to Hegel. I define myself more as a Hegelian. Why? Hegel is considered Hegel is considered a madman, you know, the guy absolute knowing and so on and so on. No, Hegel is much more modest and open. In Hegel, whenever you act, you err. So, uh, you know, you have to, there is no position of this pure acting where you know what you are doing and the result be beat will be. So I, uh, my formula is kind of, uh, ironically, I know Hegel is the greatest idealist, uh, materialist reversal of Marx by turning back to Hegel. For Hegel, Hegel says in a part that people don't uh, read, introduction to, uh, uh, forward, sorry, to philosophy of right, he says explicitly that uh, uh, the all of Minerva takes off in the evening when there is dusk, so philosophy can just grasp a social order when it's already in its decay. Philosophy cannot see into the future. It's radical openness. In 2020, we are still children of John Locke. 
still completely transfixed within the Lockean metaphysics that Engels talked about. Despite a dialectical mode of thinking existing for hundreds of years now, the world has yet to completely embrace it in its total analysis. Thus, understanding the fundamental contradictions of capitalism is still very difficult for most. And in this very dialectical logic, Zizek points out that this is shown in the very unfreedom of the freedom that we are subjected to. Either sell your labor power to a capitalist or suffer and die in poverty. Here, the actual free choice is to escape this dichotomy altogether. Here, Zizek sees the actual horizon of communism. A system past capitalism is emerging in contexts that are widely different than the traditional historical canon. Capitalism may be the end of history, but under the end of capitalism, the history we know of truly ends. But the communist horizon is only set because of its emerging problems. Its inability to truly emerge through the 19th and 20th century is the true Marxist analysis itself. In a true Marxist sense, communism is not our holy salvation. It's a new set of problems we must dialectically overcome. Zizek precisely says this, The problem of Western Marxism, and even of Marxism tout court, was the absence of the revolutionary subject. How is it that the working class did not complete the passage from being in itself to being for itself, and did not constitute itself as a revolutionary agent? This problem provided the main reason for its appeal to psychoanalysis, which was evoked precisely to explain the unconscious libidinal mechanisms that prevent the rise of a class consciousness inscribed in the very being or social condition of the working class. In this way, the truth of Marx's socioeconomic analysis was saved and there was no reason to give ground to revisionist theories about the rise of the middle classes. This search for a revolutionary subject or individual is even more difficult today. We talk about unification of people, black, white, straight, gay, yet with the new emerging identities under capitalism, it does more to divide, despite liberal universalism, of people of equal rights, equal standings, and merits. And this is not fundamentally a bad thing at all. This is actually why people call Zizek a transphobe for pointing out new emergent, radically individual approaches to humanity under capitalism. And Zizek points out, ironically and dialectically, that this new shape-shifting form of capitalist, ever-evolving identity arguably can do more to actually harm these people in the end. Sorry, I had to point this out. I feel like this is just such a lazy argument against Zizek. He doesn't claim that these identities don't exist or don't matter. Rather, they're just being co-opted by corporations and large capitalist institutions. That's all. But with how relatively new these identities have become under a capitalistic context, there are new sets of contradictions that we must dialectically overcome and synthesize. Zizek points out a sort of dialectical continuation of capitalism that inherently divides yet promises to unify. Look at the internet, for example. We were promised open sourced unity, yet in the end, it's arguably done more to divide. People argue about the most mundane things like Marvel movies, and through the very analysis of revolutions of the past, the most Marxist analysis is to point out the necessary contradictions within them like we do with capitalism. Zizek explicitly states this here. So what is the conclusion? Should we write off the Communist Manifesto as an interesting document of the past and nothing more? In a properly dialectical paradox, the very impasses and failures of 20th century communism, impasses that were clearly grounded in the limitations of the Communist Manifesto itself, at the same time, bear witness to its actuality. The classic Marxist solution failed, but the problem remains. Today, communism is not the name of a solution, but the name of a problem, namely that of commons in all of its dimensions. The problem of a commons of nature as the substance of our life, the problem of our biogenetic commons, the problem of our cultural commons, intellectual property, and last but not least, the problem of a commons as the universal space of humanity from which no one should be excluded. Whatever the solution, it will have to deal with these problems. The relevancy of the Communist Manifesto is exactly that. It's not nearly as relevant today. But the central dialectical logic, the analysis of contradictions hidden within Marx's thought, is where we see relevancy truly emerge. This is why the most radically Marxist thing you could do is to not be a Marxist. To be a Marxist is to leave behind prior ghosts and dialectically move forward. Dialectics require conflict and contradiction. 
Thus, communism isn't the typical holy salvation many Marxists claim it to be. It's a new set of fundamental problems that must be solved. Thank you guys for watching. I thought the relevancy of the Communist Manifesto was extremely interesting, so I hope all of you guys thoroughly enjoyed. As always, I couldn't do any of this without patrons. Thank you to everyone who supports, and if any of you guys are interested in pledging on Patreon or becoming a YouTube member, I have all kinds of perks. You get early access to content, you get exclusive content, you get to vote on future videos, stuff like that. So, kind of cool stuff. I want to be able to offer you guys something tangibly in return for your financial support. Something else that is incredibly important and that really helps this channel is bookmarking our Amazon link and just using it whenever you purchase anything on Amazon. I get just a small percentage and uh, Jeff Bezos has to pay me for it, so it's a win-win. And last but not least, if any of you guys have Amazon Prime but you do not use any of the perks on Twitch, feel free to head on over to our Twitch and subscribe via Twitch Prime. But again, only do this if you do not use it uh, and you do not watch other streams on Twitch. If any of you have these accounts laying dormant, it gives me just a couple dollars and uh, it costs you nothing. So again, guys, thank you again for all the support. I truly appreciate it and hopefully I can see you in the next video.